to another episode of The Big Game Hunters. I'm Mike. And I'm Tom. Thank you so much for your support so far with our Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> we're really looking forward to Season 3. Today, we're going to look at Nourishima Hex, a combat tile laying game. But first, chit chat. In today's chit chat, we're going to be talking about why we game, both as a species and individually. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the Chit Chat. Today, we're gonna to be discussing why we play games. So I think we both kind of came at this topic independently. Yep. We probably would have had this been, have been the first Chit Chat if we had talked about it earlier. But I think it's kind of a nice one to, as one of our late Chit Chats, to kind of frame the things we've already talked about. Yeah. So uh, what made me think of this was I took a class on Coursera a while ago on gamification, and Professor Werbach and that talked about why we game, talked about kind of the definition of games mm -hmm. and how hard they are to define actually. But uh, this also, I thought, was presented very nicely in a video on the Vsauce YouTube channel from Michael. And he explained that animals and humans, to some extent, when they're children, engage in disorganized play as a means of developing life skills, as a means of kind of getting certain, you know, uh, mental tasks down. But, you know, and some people think physical ones he wasn't as convinced because it's kind of a huge expenditure of physical resources if mm -hmm. you're an animal in the wild mm -hmm. to engage in play where you could potentially get hurt but he said that you know it's important to child development it's important to animal development to get these kind of mental schema in and uh he says as we've become more complex as a species as you know humans have become more and more complex we've kind of had to move up maslow's hierarchy of needs yep. we've needed higher and higher order needs and they tend to be more difficult to grasp. When we're hungry, we simply eat. That's pretty easy. But uh, to fulfill these kind of more amorphous needs, like you know, uh, love, you know, and, and that kind of thing, we need something kind of a nice structure. So right. he says life is kind of a big game, but we never really know what the rules are. We never know what the moves we can make are. We don't especially know whether a choice we've made in the past was good or bad until long after we've made it. In a game, though, with with organized rules you know immediately what options you have, how they work together, how you go against your uh, the other opponents in the game. So it gives us that sense of reward and sense of gratification and sense of challenging ourselves without all the uncertainty present in the challenges we face in you know everyday life. Yeah, the, uh, the, the higher mental needs that we need, uh, not only we can get them in other areas of our life, but they're great to get from board games mm -hmm. because of the consistency with which you you receive those rewards or that recognition, um, uh, many the the big things that I think of that uh, give us that board games give us as as far as our psychological needs, uh, comp competence competence. So this is the kind of uh, behavior you'll see in someone who's like changing careers or changing jobs. They're they're seeking to gain like mastery over their their domain or hmm. or. Um, yeah, just like they're they're mastering their domain, or they're uh, um, not gratified by the level of mastery that like they they feel they're beyond their job. Mm. So you you get so either extreme, right? right either extreme. You uh, you get that same kind of need for competence from board games. Um, either you ha are in the process of mastering a game, or you have mastered it. You still enjoy it, or you have mastered it and you're done with it. I've moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is autonomy. Uh, you'll experience this in real life in your terrible twos. Everybody yells no to their mom all the time in their terrible twos. That's the first time the child is exploring autonomy. Uh, we get that from board games in uh, just like uh, within the rules of the game, you're, you are self-deterministic. You are deciding your path toward victory or, um, or, or even like with king making, deciding who, you know, mm -hmm. like you get some autonomy in deciding who wins, things like that. And there are no kind of factors that are unknown to you in right, board games. Right, right. You know all the rules. You know what factors are in your control. Yeah, yeah. And then the the last psychological need that board games really give us, the biggest one, uh, is relatedness. Mm -hmm. If you look like on uh, uh, question websites like Yahoo Answers or About.com, a question like uh, why do we play games, if you only see you will only see four six four answer six answers on the front page, and four of them are going to be I play games because I socialize. I checked that on three different sites, it was the same. So it might have been the same people, but who knows. Uh, but relatedness is the psychological need. It's uh, the need to like not only interact with, with people, but feel like 
uh, you have influenced them in some way or you have contributed to their existence in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you'll get that at, at almost any game, but especially games in which you're socializing. Yeah, I kind of, um, talking about the, the different reasons reminds me of Mark Rosewater's different magic players. Yeah. He wrote an article quite a while ago about Johnny, Timmy, and Spike. And Johnny liked cards that could combo in interesting ways and make these crazy, you know, one-turn kill decks. Timmy really liked the big creatures, those big green creatures, or the big titans of the game. Spike liked the kind of barely under-costed cards, just the really efficient, really um, high-utility spells. And he talked about designing for all these different players. He, want, he said, you know, in any given set, we want cards that will satisfy every player type. Later, I think, and much more interestingly, he expanded these definitions a little bit and it codified them as, you know, Timmy wants to experience something. Johnny wants to express himself and Spike wants to win. And so that's really what's driving their desire to play certain cards. And I think that's kind of universalizable across gamers. He also said that uh, that the different categories can be crossed over. So somebody could be, like me, I think, a Johnny Spike. Mm -hmm. I like to win. I definitely play hard. I play to win. But I also kind of want to express myself. So in a, that's, I think, why I gravitate towards the deck builders and the tableau builders. In a game like Thunderstone, one of my favorites, I want to win, obviously, and I want to go for the most efficient path. But I really like it if I can make a nice, you know, clean deck. If I can make something that really comes together using maybe just one hero or, you know, just a small number of different card types mm -hmm. in order to feel like I've built a cool engine. Something that's unique to me. Something that I can kind of show off at the end and say, oh, yeah, I have all these points. But I also, you know, only have seven cards in my deck. That's so great. You know, that's so crazy. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm kind of a Johnny Spike in that way. That's why I game. I think I'd probably first categorize myself as a Timmy. I definitely want to experience, like I love the games that tell a story mm -hmm. more than I love the games that that are just strategic tactical stuff. Um, but I'm also a Johnny. I like to express myself. I like to like, it doesn't matter if this particular combo or move is, is suboptimal as long as it's cool, as long <laughs> as the result is interesting. Yeah. So I, I'm definitely a combo between Timmy and Spike, uh, Timmy and Johnny. Johnny. Yeah. Spike's the guy who wants to win. I don't care about winning. <laughs> I think we all have a little bit of each. Like, I certainly am, more of my Timmy comes out when we play Star Trek Fleet Captains. Yeah. Because that's a game where, despite it not being, you know, very, just very tactical or very strategic, there's not so much skill in Fleet Captains, uh, I really just like experiencing the game. I like feeling like, the you know, the ships are moving around through space and encountering wormholes and... Uh, black holes and uh, you know tribbles and con and Q and all these different things in the Star Trek universe, and it really feels like I'm in that game. So I definitely am a Timmy when I'm in that game. So I think sometimes, even though the games might not appeal to some core part of why you play, they kind of can draw something out in you too. Like Guillotine kind of draws something out in me. Battlestar Galactica, I love role playing in that game. Shadows Over Camelot, same thing. Yeah. So there's also that kind of, and that's, I guess, a real big Johnny part of me, that, that role-playing element. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what I'm looking for in games, but I love those games, and they kind of draw that out in me. I think beyond just those three types, the biggest thing I get is the mental exercise of games. Uh, it, the, the three um, psychological needs I listed before, I really relate with all of those. Uh, I, initially, I got into the hobby through role-playing games, so it was j mainly just socialization, but... Uh, you know, you get drawn to the, the idea of the, the critical thinking exercises that you get from, from competence and from autonomy a little bit. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it was really those three elements for me that I was just like, yes, this absolutely, absolutely needed for a healthy life, these mm -hmm. three things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you mentioned this earlier when we were just talking informally that with the competency thing, you, people want to play games that are kind of where they're challenged but not overwhelmed. Sure. And I think that was an interesting point, that you know we're attracted to games that are at a, in a certain kind of range of mental strain or yeah. mental difficulty. Yeah. It kind of made me think of the Brain Burner episode, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, when we talked about how you know certain games are brain burners for certain people. So for me, you know, I like Race. That's a good kind of brain burning for me. I like Race for the Galaxy. But you know, we said, I think it was Amon Ray, is a bad kind of brain burning. Yeah. I don't think it's... 
I don't know if it's just too hard for me, but it's it takes me a long time to get through it. So yeah. that that certainly is a valid whatever, argument. There. Whatever it is, it's certainly individual because there are people who love only those games, mm-hmm. those critical thinking kind of games. Yeah, absolutely. Any other uh, reasons why we game that you can think of? Maybe not personal to us, but to other people. Um, I mean, I think you know everyone has their own reasons, but I think that we've kind of categorized the big ones. I think that the I do like the Jimmy Tony. Timmy, Johnny Spike uh, mm-hmm. distinction. I think that you know all the high order needs that you gave are certainly pre- prevalent in games. Well, it'll be interesting to see what the commenters have to say about why they game. Yeah, definitely. In the meantime, we're going to do Nourishima Hex, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. Now I'm going to teach you to play Nourishima Hex. Nourishima Hex is a tile laying combat game set in a post apocalyptic future. The goal of the game is to have the last headquarters standing. The game ends as soon as this occurs, or as soon as a player draws the last tile from his or her deck. When this happens, the other players will have one final turn, and then there will be a final battle to determine the victor. Nirishima Hex comes with a number of cardboard components. All the action will take place on the board, and most game modes simply use the green spaces in the center. Every player will be given a very helpful faction chart. This goes over all the units you'll have in detail. And on the back, you'll get some background information about your faction and some general strategy. Of course, the meat of the game are the hexes. Each player will have one headquarters hex that's the same on both sides. Each headquarter has some things in common. For instance, each headquarters will attack on an initiative of zero and will attack at a strength of one in every direction at melee range. In addition, each headquarters will give some sort of special benefit to allied units around it. For instance, the Moloch headquarters will give all Moloch units plus one range attack. Your deck will have 35 tiles in it, not counting your headquarters, and be comprised of both units and instant action tiles. The units have a few stats along the edges. You might see these small triangles. This one has two small triangles. Those represent melee attacks. Melee attacks simply attack adjacent units that they're facing. In addition, you might see larger triangles for ranged attacks. Ranged attacks go through friendly units and hit the first enemy unit in the line. They have no maximum range. The strength of the attack is based on the number of triangles. They range from one to three. This is how much damage they'll deal to enemy headquarters, and also helps pierce armor to destroy other units. This unit does possess armor along three of the edges. These are these white bars. The armor will reduce any incoming ranged attacks by one strength. They have no effect on melee attacks. This unit also has an extra point of toughness. That's the plus sign. For each point of toughness, or each plus sign on the unit, it can take one additional wound before being destroyed. If a unit has no plus signs, that means that any damage will destroy it. Some units might have multiple initiatives. For instance, this unit acts on the second initiative and on the first initiative. The initiatives go from in order, with three being the highest printed initiative, down to zero. Initiative can never be reduced below zero, so an object can always attack. In addition, you'll see that this has a ranged attack on the top, in that direction, and it has one point of toughness. You might also find nets. This unit nets in two directions. If a net is facing another unit, that unit is inhibited and cannot do anything while the net is on it. The net lasts through the current battle round. In other words, if the unit that is being netted is netted during its initiative, it cannot act, even if it is unnetted later by having the net unit destroyed. Finally, you might see mobility on units. That's the little arrow symbol. Mobility means the unit can essentially act as if a move tile was placed on it once per round. It can do so before or after you've placed your other tiles for the turn. And you'll also have in your deck modules. This is a subset of your unit tiles. Modules have little connector symbols. This one has three different connections. And if a module is connected to another unit, it it confers special benefits to that unit. This module increases all the units it's connected to's initiative by one. 
Then each faction has instant action tiles. The common ones include moving, a move tile when played, you choose a unit that you control and move it one hex. You can also rotate it to any new facing you like. A push tile pushes an enemy unit away from the unit doing the pushing. If you cannot push the unit away, creating distance from the pushing tile, you may not play a push. The opponent who is being pushed can choose from multiple directions if both of them create distance. You also have common battle tiles. Battle tiles are crucial because when a battle tile is played, it, generate, it creates a battle. A battle tile must be the last card you play on your turn, and you cannot play a battle tile on the last round of the game. Some special tiles that are specific to the factions include a sniper tile. Sniper tiles deal one damage to any unit on the board. Uh, armor does not stop a sniper shot, and it cannot be played on a headquarters. A grenade is played from the base launching the grenade and destroys any unit. Again, it cannot be played on headquarters. Finally, an airstrike can be called down on any hex. It must be played so that the airstrike can take up the full amount of space. It'll hit one hex and every adjacent hex for a total of seven hexes. Each unit in that area receives one damage. That's all for the tiles. You'll also have bullet tokens to denote wounds on units with multiple points of toughness, and little score markers for each faction to denote the headquarters total hit points. Again, the hit points start at 20, and when a headquarters is destroyed, that player is eliminated from the game. To set up a game of Nirishima Hex, each player will first choose a faction. I like Moloch. Then you'll randomly determine the starting player, and that player will place his or her headquarters on any empty space on the map. Then in turn order, each other player will place his or her headquarters. They may be placed adjacent to enemy headquarters, but at no point during the game will the headquarters actually attack one another using their attacks. Then you'll take the 35 non-headquarter tiles associated with your faction and shuffle them together to form your deck. Now you're ready to begin. Nirishima Hex is played out in turns. On the very first turn of the game, the first and second player will draw fewer hexes than normal. The first player will draw only one hex and may play it, and the second player will draw only two hexes and may play both. From this point on, all players will draw up to three hexes at the beginning of the turn. Then they will discard one and may choose to play, keep, or discard the other two in any combination. When playing a unit to the board, either a soldier or a module, you can place it to any open space and in any orientation you like. The orientation is important because units will only attack in particular directions. When playing an instant action token, you will apply it to any unit on the board. So for instance, the move token, you will choose one of your own units and move it up to one space, rotating it as desired. When any player plays a battle tile or when the board is filled by the last unit, or at the very end of the game, a battle will commence. When this happens, units will attack in initiative order from highest to lowest. You'll resolve initiative in phases. So first, you'll resolve the three initiative phase. In this phase, all three initiative units will make their attacks. If two in three initiative units are attacking one another, they will both be destroyed. Any casualties that result from this phase will be removed at the end of the phase. If a unit with a lower initiative is destroyed during a higher initiative phase, it will not get to act during that battle. You'll continue playing in this manner until, in a multiplayer game, either there is only one headquarters left standing, or one player has exhausted his tile deck. At this point, each other player will get one final turn, and then the player with the most hit points on his or her headquarters is declared the winner. That's how you play Nurishima Hex. Now that you know how to play Nurishima Hex, we're going to take a look at it in our patented Point Counterpoint review. Because Mike and I agree about the game, I'm going to roll to see who will argue for it and who will argue against. If it's even, I'll take the pros, and if it's odd, he will. It's odd. So I will tell you how much I enjoy Nurishima Hex. And I will, once again, tell you why I don't like games. Back to form. 
So, I knew it couldn't last for long, Tom. <laughs> what I like about Nurishima Hacks is that it's got such a different combat system. I feel like the strategy in Nurishima Hacks is unlike any other game I've played. It's not like, uh, you know, positioning in Summoner Wars or positioning in Nexus Ops. It's uniquely its own because you're constantly looking about who is going to be attacking what and when. So there's a constant kind of interplay between the units, the nets, the initiatives. You're constantly trying to get damage on your opponent's uh, headquarters, but you're also trying to make sure that you have your you know, high initiative units take out their high priority targets. So that three phase structure, the, mm -hmm. you know, the three stages of the different initiative, really I think works well in the game. It really gives the game uh, a sense of kind of interplay, a sense of rock, paper, scissors combat to it. Yeah. I also like that, of course, there are no dice. You know how me and dice just do not get along. <laughs> so uh, this one does a really nice job of that. You know, kind of like Dungeon Command, you simply apply the damage. You know, if, if the attack makes it through, I really like that. There's no sort of random elements to it. You you know, going into any battle, exactly what's going to happen. You can yeah. just foresee it. And but at the same time, leading because you don't know when a battle is going to occur. Leading up to a battle, there's a lot of kind of guessing and kind of hedging your bets about where things are going to shake out. Yeah, that's really uh, the first bad thing I have to say about it, is that you don't know when battles are going to happen. Mm -hmm. It makes it so hard to uh, predict, I guess, where you need to place things. So you can judge the board at any given time and say, well, if there's a battle right now, I should do this, this, and this. But you don't know when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You, How many battle tiles does each deck get? Four? It's Four. It varies. Oh, it varies. So... Um, yeah, it, it's just too too unpredictable in the, the the battle, like when battles can come. The other aspect of that is if you get an unlucky draw and you're not and you're only pulling actions or uh, module tiles, mm -hmm. you're not even involved in combat. You, yeah. you don't get to do anything. You don't even, you can't even get your foot in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean to add to that, I also think that the nets are really broken. Uh, the factions that have the nets have a distinct advantage. Being able to net the base is really the problem. The fact that you can net the other player's headquarters and make it so that they don't make any attacks in any direction really limits it. But uh, other than that, I feel like the abilities are pretty unique. The factions feel a little samey. Blue and yellow kind of get mixed up in my head. But the abilities are pretty cool. You know, For instance, on Moloch, the clown can call down an airstrike as per the tile. That's pretty cool. The gauss cannon can fire kind of a penetrating beam all the way down the line through units. There are units that kind of have an evocative tank feel to them. Um, they, you know, it has armor and toughness, but no weapons whatsoever. So the units kind of fill different roles. They feel like they're all kind of, they're not really evocative, but they feel like they all have kind of a niche placement. They all have kind of a role in your larger faction army. So I really like that about it. The modules, being able to steal other players' modules for like the mother box, things like that. Uh, yeah, I just feel like the abilities are pretty cool on the units. Yeah, they're pretty cool, but you, I mean, you, you don't really get to maximize using them. You, you're really just dependent on, you get to draw your three, you discard one and use two, and each turn you're really only dealing with those two. Um, you, you could do get to activate whatever abilities on guys you have out, those are sometimes neat, so like dropping the bomb, that's probably why that one stands out, because he's always on the board waiting to do that. <laughs> It's just the the limiting factor of the the opening hand or the the hand of each turn you, that you get. It's just so limiting for your options in the game. Yeah, I'll give you that. It's something I'd really like to explore house ruling at some point in the near future. But uh, even though there is that natural limitation, the game is quite expansive in how many play modes it really well supports. So you can play it as a three or four player free for all. You can play it as a two on two team match, as I almost always do. Uh, you can play it one on one. It works pretty well. The board isn't overwhelmingly large or small for any number. The board has expandability to it. So even though most matches, traditional matches, are played on just the green as uh, green parts in the center, you also can expand it out with different uh, variants. So for instance, this one comes with the Mad Bomber who runs around the board blowing stuff up. Uh, it comes with different mercenaries you can throw into your faction. Mm -hmm. You can play with you know, different scenarios to try to become evocative of the Nirishima RPG. So there's a lot of different stuff in the box that you can do with it. Uh, even though there are some limits on how the core gameplay flows, you can explore a lot of different options so this can meet the needs of a lot of different players. Yeah, that's true. It just feels like I've, I've only ever played it free for all. I'll, I'll say that up front. Uh, I've never played the other modes. But it just feels like 
uh, all the games I've played are so anticlimactic. Mm. They, you, you spend all this time worrying about positioning, where you're going to place your tiles, looking for the battle tiles when you need them. You come down to the end. First of all, half the time, I'll get a battle tile right at the end. That's completely useless because <laughs> I can't play it. And the other half of the time, it's just a matter of who has put the most damage on the opponent's uh, headquarters, big, headquarters yeah. each time. That, that's just so anticlimactic because you spend so much time worrying about defense and offense and, and positioning. You want to win by dominating. You mm -hmm. want to win by wiping out opponents. And that can happen in a multiplayer game. It'll, it'll certainly happen at least once in a multiplayer game. But even then, even the win condition is always determined just by who has the most damage or the least damage. And that's just so blase. Yeah, uh, so I can understand that it's anticlimactic, but what do you think of it on the whole, Tom? Well, um, personally, I, I, most of the points I said about the game are the point, the problems I have with the game. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you said, mentioned that the factions feel samey to you. I, I disagree. That's probably my favorite thing about them. And the one, re, the one redeeming thing about the game that would make me want to house rule away all the problems I mentioned is the fact that I really think the factions feel different hmm. and by getting rid of some of the problems with house rules, like uh, we've talked about um, uh, uh, LCG style opening hand, like uh, start with four or five tiles or something and you get to play two out of that. I think that would really help improve the game, but as it is, I just can't, I, it's so anticlimactic at the end, it's so dependent on the, the only two tiles that you get each turn, mm -hmm. I gotta give it a four out of 10. Now you've also been playing the iPad version quite a bit. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that while we're at it? Um, I think they need to work out the AI a little bit. It seems like it can predict the tiles mm -hmm. that, it, that, it, yeah. that it hasn't seen yet. Like, no reason it should be able to, but it seems like it's able to do that. But so it's not holding like, tiles, but it knows what's, what, right. what's going on. Right. Yeah. I think that that's probably on purpose just to make it more of a challenge, because mm -hmm. without that, there's not really too much programming you can do. Yeah, so it's just a quick and dirty way to balance right. it. Right. Yeah. Uh, but... I don't know. That, that specific aspect is sort of a turnoff for me. Like, why does the computer get an advantage? Do you think it transfers well otherwise? We talked about that in a previous chit chat. Uh, you really do need to be able to play it with other people to get the most advantage okay. of it. Yeah, good to know. Uh, for this one, I haven't played the digital version. I've only played the actual cardboard one. Uh, I, you know, I agree with all the criticisms we gave. I think the the damning factor is the three chip, three chips per turn. I think we're exactly on the same page with that one. Uh, like I said, I have played this one actually kind of a lot. I have enjoyed it. I think it does get a lot better in team play. I think 2v2 does give it a big boost. You usually do end up eliminating one of the headquarters, which ends the game. So that we don't have the anticlimactic piece, but still, for a game that has this much meat to it and this much kind of potential planning to it and this much, really potential, that's the word that I think of with this game. It's all potential because there are so many cool elements to it. I love the, the combat interplay, like I said, but all of that is made into such a luck-based package because of the limited draws per turn. Yeah. Because you have to throw one out, you can end up with a situation where you draw three battle tiles on one turn. It's not, li um, it's not likely, but it's very possible, and you're screwed. You're totally out of the game. Yeah. So, yes, if, in the future, I'm considering house ruling this one, just trying it out with more of a traditional, you know, have a hand of five, draw two per turn, play two per turn. Something simple, a little more streamlined like that. And see if it works out any better. As is, out of the box, six out of 10. There's enough cool stuff to keep me interested, but it annoys me how much luck manages to be in a diceless game. All right, well, that is our review of Nurishima Hex. Get ready for the breakdown. This is the breakdown of Nurishima Hex. You can play in about 60 to 90 minutes, so we give it 60 short and 40 long. Individual turns are very short, but you don't have anything to do on your opponent's turn, and even though you only have two tiles to consider, analysis paralysis can and does set in. So we give it 65 fast and 35 slow. We give it 65 luck and 35 skill. The skill involved is where you place your tiles, but there's so much luck in getting those tiles in a usable order. We split strategy and tactics at 50-50, but it depends on the emphasis you give to placing tiles each turn or looking forward to battles as to whether you use one or the other. A perfect 100 for interaction because every action has some effect on the other players. 
We give it 15 immersion because of the descriptions on the faction cards and the game does sort of feel like a gang turf war, but there's not much else to the theme or the sort of story, so we give it 85 abstraction. We give it 70 simplicity. The rules aren't that difficult, but there is a lot to remember, especially with how combat resolves, so we give it 30 complexity. We give it 60 portability and 40 grandeur. It comes in an average size box, but it doesn't take up all that much table space. We give it 25 completeness because you can play it a few times before that starts to grow stale, but you're eventually going to want new factions and new abilities, so we give it 75 expandability. For our trophy scales, we give it 4 trophies and originality because it's a unique blend of combat and tile placement. For value, we give it 3 trophies. It is a moderately high price, but the quality components make it worthwhile. Mike gives it a 6 out of 10, Tom gives it a 4 out of 10, and that is the breakdown of Nurishima Hex. We hope you enjoyed the post-apocalyptic future of Nurishima Hex. Next week, in our season finale, we're going to be doing the season wrap-up and playing the card game you can learn in 30 seconds, Loco. This is the last week of our Kickstarter. Thank you for helping us fund Season 3, and be sure to tell a friend. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for weekly updates. See the links below for our Facebook, Twitter, and Kickstarter pages. And tell us the reasons you play games in the comments. See you next week. Iceless! God damn it! That's the thing I was going for next. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I know that we talked about writing it on my eyelids, but we actually went with the whiteboard again. <laughs> <laughs> that would work.